Yo, what's going can on? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. Can I see Excellent. you? Yet? Video should there be coming in. Yeah, Whoa, perfect. look at that pan. <laughs> I just like yeah, the, uh, the camera is stalking me around. I don't know how to turn that off. So uh, hopefully it doesn't doesn't chase me around too much. Uh, I think we'll see if it, I think it will work. That uh, should be good. Awesome, man. Yeah, it's it's been it's been great. I mean, it's been one of those things where uh yeah it's just I, I don't know i don't know what i'm doing and it's just working so i'm like fuck it I'll keep nobody doing knows it. what they're doing but hey. <laughs> exactly yeah it's At wild doing man. something it seems to be working yeah i i think you are going to absolutely blow up on x over the next sort of five years like mm. we're talking just gigantic the the platform at the moment it's kind of like being just on the launch pad for a rocket and yeah. you're already on the launch pad you're doing the right stuff and I don't think people realize what's going to happen in the next five years. Uh, X is going to go ballistic. So I agree a hundred percent. Thank you, man. That's very kind of words. Likewise to you, man. I mean, one of the things that's been super impressive with you through the, I mean, through the years, you've been at it for, for such a long, since 2019, right? 2019, 2020. Just over four years. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Started late November, 2019. Yeah. Cause your first video was a cyber truck, uh, will make billions, right? I think that was second your very video. first yeah. second video. Cyber truck okay. engineering. Yeah, the very first one was actually an ode to the, the seed that I sort of had planted in my mind for the YouTube channel, which was during my ayahuasca ceremonies. Mm. I had suspected that Elon Musk and psychedelics may have been familiar with one another. So the very first video I posted was Elon's psychedelic secret. He's since mm. been on the record saying that people should be open to psychedelics. So tick. Second one was cyber truck engineering genius, but that's the one that sort of blew up the channel. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's yeah, and it's been really fun, sort of watching your journey too, both on YouTube and X. And I agree a, a thousand percent with you. I, I don't think it's just like a, like a me thing either. I think just X as a platform has so much potential because the foundation is built to, like from from where it was, say you know a year, year and a half ago to where it is now. It's a completely different platform, and I think a lot of people are viewing it through that lens of what Twitter was. Versus what mm -hmm. X is trying to be in the few, in, in the in the next three four five years, and yep. and what's kind of interesting to see is sort of I've noticed some folks are uh, are unwilling to embrace the platform fully because maybe there isn't like let let's be honest the 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 tools for say vid, video creators like people that upload stuff the analytics it's just subpar compared to YouTube I mean that's we of can course, all agree yeah. on that. But mm. the opportunity there is if if one assumes that the platform will grow over time, the people that are creating content now will have an outsized advantage once the discoverability is turned on because your 100%. content is not competing against anybody. <laughs> it's like, That's right. That's why I know? mentioned about being on the rocket pad. If you're already yeah. there when this thing surges, because I think that they're focusing in terms of priorities, what's the most important thing to nail? You can create video content now. But you can't monetize very well. You can't discover very well, blah, blah, blah. There's lots of little... But the main stuff is people can create video now. They can create long-form video. That's there. And I think people are, are missing a pretty big trick if they're not... If they're content creators in particular and they're not publishing their content on X, understanding that it's basically day zero. It's only going to get better from here. And the discoverability is... If, if you have an engaging piece of content, millions, many millions, 10 million people in a day can see what you've posted. That's insane. 100%. But like you think about those numbers, it's... You don't see that on YouTube. Even somebody like, unless you're like Mr. Beast level, you're not going to get that sort of a reach. And I think that's something that people aren't really appreciating about X. I agree 100%. And it, it's like the, the the amount of, like the reach of X is 10X more than YouTube's with my content. Like, I'll, mm -hmm. and I don't know if uh, one one reach unit is one view unit. I don't, I don't view it that way. But what's mm -hmm. different there though is like on YouTube, the your reach is like your impressions right so the thumbnail title shows up mm -hmm. on the home screen for somebody and then so mm -hmm. that counts as an impression and the view mm -hmm. to impression ratio i think for me is like 10 percent or something like the click through rate is yep. eight to ten percent which is really mm -hmm. freaking good and i'm very thankful to have that kind of yep. click through rate it's freaking amazing it must be like the, uh, the pineapple in the butt thumbnails <laughs> they work don't they <laughs> Ah, yeah, it's exactly. amazing. <laughs> I've been experimenting, you know, and it's mm -hmm. it's funny because I always I, I try to be very mindful. I never want to be insulting to my audience, right? I never want to say I, I never want to make a just clickbait that is is like disingenuous because I think what's mm -hmm. what's interesting about clickbait. There was this video by uh, I think I forget his name, but he was talking about um, a clickbait that works well that is done in good faith. It's really legit. Talking about veritasium. Derek? Yes, that's exactly right. Did you watch that video? Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. 
He makes a good and, point. Uh, it's a fine line. You want to entice people to watch and not mislead them. And there is some efficacy to the way you structure and title and thumbnail a video to generate people's interest. Yeah. But you don't want to then deliver something they weren't expecting. And it's a definitely a fine line. But yeah, it can make all the difference. I very rarely sort of tinker with titles and thumbnails, but extremely occasionally I'll see a video and I'll go, this is absolutely, this doesn't make sense. This, the, you know, the performance on this video, something's wrong here. Let me do a quick change. Bam, I'll change the title. And suddenly it just starts climbing. I'll, if you really focus on that, it can make a major difference. And I've never really wanted to, to sort of be misleading in my thumbnails or titles, but just the, the way that the words are structured, you know, using a certain word versus another word can make all the difference between more people Huge. seeing the content and not. And I've rarely, if ever, I don't know if I've ever actually, I don't know, a few times I get some haters, I've rarely seen somebody say, this video sucks shit, you're shit, I wasted my time, fuck you. It doesn't happen very often, but basically almost never. And the occasions <laughs> that it does, it's the same people that just say, you suck, I hate you, I yeah. hate you die on fire. Constantly. <laughs> Your biggest fans. <laughs> and Exactly. And so it's a fine line, but I think that you have to think that you've got something of value to add and you really want to entice people to, to click, but it is a fine line. And, you know, you're never going to please everybody with titles, thumbnails, et cetera, but you don't want to be tricking your audience too often because they're not going to be loyal returning viewers. They're like, fuck this guy. That's not what I was expecting. I'm not going to make that same mistake again. A lot of people do that because it's a short-term sort of sugar high. Yeah. You might get a few short-term views and but over the long term, it just doesn't work out. And what's interesting about how X does it now, like if you compare how how content flows through X and how content flows through YouTube, like like how people land at the con on the content, I think what's interesting about how X's algorithm is, and really Twitter's beforehand too, in a way, is that it's much more aligned with how a human spreads information than how an algorithm tries to push information, right? Because I think the way the way True. YouTube is packaged is like it's trying, an algorithm is trying to optimize the the sort of how, how uh, a person will react to a to a image and some words put together mm -hmm. and it tries to mm -hmm. predict which who did a good job with that because mm -hmm. it thinks mm -hmm. that's how people should react and on x is much more like this person found it interesting they share yeah. it they click the retweet yeah. and if somebody has exactly. a large audience then a lot of people see it you know yeah it's much more organic you're definitely right the it youtube is. algorithm is is pretty cold and it mechanical is. it's just literally okay at this level to this kind of viewer which thumbnail and title click okay they watch more click 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 it just keeps going up and up and up whereas what's driving on x is interactions and sharing from real people if people are spending more time watching this content retweeting and sharing that's how it ends up going viral so it's pretty different uh x may be missing out on you know total views and interactions as a result an algorithm doing things more coldly might be a little bit better but I much more appreciate the kind of content that X is serving up because it's doing so because other humans appreciated it as opposed to an algorithm deciding, you know, which pineapple up the butt thumbnail and title is the one that gets the most clicks to this viewer. Yeah. And, and, and I find myself on X a lot more, especially as of late than YouTube for some reason. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know why. Like oh, when yeah. I look at my, I don't know if it's the same for you. It's like, it just kind of happened, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm being fairly strategic in terms of, I mean, I post my videos now on both platforms. So what I post on YouTube now, and the only thing I do on YouTube, you can also find on X, but on YouTube, you cannot find any of my posts on X or any mm. of the other stuff. So YouTube, even though the majority of my watch time audience, blah, 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 are still watching on YouTube, it's a fraction of the overall content I'm producing. And there's nothing now on YouTube you can't get on X, but there's a lot of things on X you can't get on YouTube. Very true. So, uh, yeah, again, I think the potential of X people aren't quite really understanding. Uh, I think once X nails monetization of videos and discovery, so people can, because a lot of creators now, they're not stupid, right? If you really care about the bottom line, you're not going to post your videos on X because you realize, oh, 10,000 people watch it on X, I could have earned some revenue on YouTube. But the people that aren't concerned about their pocket cross-posting now, once monetization is enabled and you can have the mid-roll ads, which annoy people, and obviously YouTube, uh, X can have like premium subscriptions to remove those, just like YouTube has YouTube premium. Yep. A lot of big content creators are going to start posting their content across and YouTube's going to be, I think, panicking pretty hard once they see folks like MKBHD and, you know, really large channels start moving content across. They're going to panic pretty hard. For sure. And, and, I'm, and I wonder how much of the audience is on both. You know, I think I think there's still I think the audiences are quite segregated to this. Like, I think there's definitely overlap, 
But I think there are people on X that would have never seen my content ever on YouTube, even if they're on YouTube, mm -hmm. because yep. of how information spreads on X. And I oh, think yeah, that's where sure. people like MKBHD are going to be freak. I mean, they're going to 10x their freaking audience, <laughs> like le legitimately. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's wild. Yeah. Crazy. How's your 2023, bro? It's December. Uh, Give it's, me a recap. Well, I always have a goal at the start of the year of making it my best year ever. I'm on a streak of about a decade and a half now. So again, best year of all time. Congrats. Uh, you know, I'm healthier, uh, happier, more content, have a much better balance in terms of lifestyle, spending time with friends, family. You know, in the past, my biggest challenge historically has been just no spare time. I'd be working my brains, but, you know, just completely killing myself basically working. But I have a really good balance now, I'm basically doing part-time hours. And most of the stuff that I'm doing on a daily basis, I wouldn't be doing anyway learning about Tesla, seeing what's going on. And half of my videos now are just what would be going on in my head when I was reading or, or seeing what was happening. So sure. I have a really great balanced lifestyle now that's super sustainable. And yeah, just kind of continually getting better. I've been focused a lot on health, energy optimization for the last probably three or so years. And that's improving. My sleep continues to get better, which has been the bane of my existence for my entire life. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm now slightly above average in terms of my sleep scores versus just a normal human versus that's awesome a couple of years ago atrocious so yeah winning on all fronts uh, obviously the youtube the content x etc is going well but i'm not really too much focused on the metrics and numbers there i'm just much more focused on the process i've also been able to speed up my workflow so things are really humming along now i'm always trying to delete processes and it's stunning a few things a while ago i won't get into boring details most viewers won't care but there's been a few optimizations i've made throughout the last six or so months. Yeah. And I'm like, how yeah. did I not think of that? I'm so dumb. And I just think about all the cumulative time that I lost doing something stupid that was unnecessary in a really poorly structured process. It took me nearly 1,200 videos to realize what a moron I was, which is one particular thing. I'm like, What was the I biggest dumb? one? So the biggest one for me, long story short, is a couple of years ago, I realized that you could use an AI editor to do most of your edits for you. If you're recording in one session and you're taking a breather break, somebody could find something that'll cut out pauses in audio. I mean, that's just no-brainer stuff. I was looking for a solution like this for a few years, tried a few, didn't work. Eventually found one maybe 12 months ago. And that'll put sort of cuts throughout my videos, throughout the whole content process. And what I was doing previously was in order to avoid having a mid-roll ad appear in a really annoying place, I was going through my videos manually and figuring out where my ad breaks were after I'd recorded and exported. Uh, during, sorry, during the recording the, and editing process, right? I'm like, okay, an ad break will fit here. And I was trying to line them up every one second because otherwise it's wow. with YouTube. You don't want to interrupt it. Now I've realized with that AI editor, I can just export the video and while I'm uploading, I can just page down and go through all the cuts and find the one second breaks that I was manually putting in while I was editing in a few seconds after I've done it. I'm wow. like, you idiot. That was probably costing me at least <laughs> 15, 20 minutes of additional editing time per video per day. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you add that up, it's, it's many, many dozens of hours per, per year. And it's also just a big cognitive load. Like every time you switch tasks, it sort of burns a lot more energy than you'd imagine. So... Just a little thing like that has made a huge improvement in my workflow now. And I'm so stupid because I, I could have realized <laughs> I could have been doing that a lot earlier on. I just, it didn't occur to me, but I'm always trying to think what's some way that I can speed stuff up. So one day I was thinking, can I delete the, can I just remove this process of putting ads in? And then I'm like, oh, wait, you idiot. Yes, I can. So <laughs> I'm sure the three people that make YouTube content, I'm like, oh, that was interesting. And everyone else, <laughs> wake up, hello. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff I love to hear because I I, I feel like I went through a, a similar discovery process this year. What I found, mm. so I've been very fortunate with my, so so my wife has helped me tremendously with the balance stuff big time. So I, I've I've mm -hmm. really started to nail that, not nail it, but I'm getting closer to where I, I really need to be to prevent mm -hmm. burnout. And I I faced giant burnout this year with the YouTube stuff, like a really mm -hmm. big time. And what I'd I realized- I remember mentioning that on some content earlier in the year, you were mentioning, thinking out loud about that, I'm, I'm sure. So Yeah, I, I was, and I was trying to be transparent with it because you know I, one mm -hmm. of the big things that I want to do in my channel is like, I want to be transparent with, with where I am mentally, right? If I'm feeling mm -hmm. some sort of way, I want to make sure people are aware of it because people can mm -hmm. read body language. Like if you're going to, you know, you're going to watch me, I want to make sure that if there's something that I don't feel like is up to par, I'm going to be honest about that. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and what I found is that I just, what I used to do was edit 
you know, videos five times a week, you know, and, and sit mm -hmm. down and be in front of a camera and have kind of a script sort of, and then I would find myself saying, oh, I didn't say the sentence perfectly. Let me try again. I didn't say this word perfectly. Let me try again. And mm -hmm. Steven, I fucking hate that so much. I hate, and that's what I realized. I hate uh -huh. it so much because all mm -hmm. I, it just gives me a ton of self hate because I'm like, I'm a piece of shit. Mm -hmm. I can't do this. Right. What am I doing? Right. So then I, I <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. that burns right. me out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. you know and you're a harsh what critic I, on yourself obviously yes uh i'm probably mm. my own harshest critic and i have some critics now which is really fun you know like they're yeah, always congratulations by the way that thank you you know you made it now but you've got some haters <laughs> I'm you, you know you've really made it when haters start paying for some of your content just to hate <laughs> yeah. that that's when you've really really made it <laughs> is that where you're at <laughs> yeah yeah there's levels of making that's it. amazing yeah, that's, right. that's awesome all right <laughs> I, I hope to get to your level one day <laughs> one day yeah <laughs> that's awesome but but then what i realized like okay so if you hate doing that how can you remove that entire thing from from your process and that's where mm -hmm. i started i started trying to focus so much on being perfect on camera and that's where i mm -hmm. em embraced doing live streams a lot more mm -hmm. and because yeah. live streams just force you to be in front of a camera and just if if you fuck up you fuck up like it is what it that's is right, right? you gotta and keep you rolling you can't you can't just free record yeah exactly and that's where i i was and then it's something a light bulb went off in my head i'm like dude this i feel so much better so like now mm. i'm very comfortable not being perfect so that was a huge mm -hmm. thing and it, i think that ha has had some downstream effects as well with how i approach content you know fear of being mm -hmm. saying something wrong that i did a lot of research on and people are going to think i'm stupid if i said mm -hmm. something wrong it's like well if you say something wrong just say it. you just said wrong and correct it big fucking deal move on right mm -hmm. so that was huge mm -hmm. and it's dramatically improved my uh my uh my process for content so that instead of spending hours Ret doing retakes, edits, hating myself, being burned out from the process, I can now let this thing go and think about the yep. kind of content I want to make. So that's been yep. game changing for me. Game changing. Yep. Yeah. And I just yeah. want to share that because it's like, I don't know if you've gone through the same, through the same battle on your end, but that, that was a battle, man. That was a huge mental battle for me. And I'm glad I, yeah. I think I'm on the other side now. I hope. Mm. Well, yeah. in my situation, I, I don't have that harsh internal critic. I, I do have high standards for myself, but I'm also, I think it was honestly the copious amounts of psychedelics I did in my 20s. I'm just far beyond mm -hmm. giving a flying fuck what anyone thinks about me. I'm so jealous. <laughs> and I just can't emphasize that. I just don't care. So it shows. I will record videos. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I will record videos today and I will occasionally do a re-record if I completely just say something that like just blur and vomit out something that is incoherent to the point where it will be too distracting to viewers i'll do a quick retake maybe that happens once or twice in a video if you're lucky maybe once on average not even but outside of that i'll just keep rolling and sometimes i'll slur words and mispronounce and i know i'll mispronounce and i'm like i don't give a fuck even though there's going to be people in the comments hey bro you said this word wrong like, yeah. i know that's gonna happen but i just don't care and so i've never had that sort of harsh critic that's you know really really hard on myself i do have high standards but I realized that who cares what other people think, you know, as long as I'm not making content that is just so confusing because I've said something that's completely incomprehensible to the point where people won't understand the meaning. I don't care. Like I don't read reread my posts on X ever before I post them. And I make typos all the time and I don't care. The mm. only time I've gone back and edited a tweet or, or post is I think I've done that twice now is because the meaning had changed because auto replace had done something and it just it didn't actually convey the meaning. Otherwise, don't care. And a lot of people, I think, get way too worried. Oh, no. What if someone, oh, shit, someone retweeted. Oh, no, this is going viral. Oh, what do I do? Yeah. Help. And I'm like, who cares, bro? Um, and the other thing, too, is why should you care what anyone whose opinion you wouldn't value thinks about you in the first place, you know? Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. It, something my wife told me that really resonated. She said, uh, what other people think of you is none of your business. Yeah. I was like, great whoa. Quote. Shit, yeah. that makes a lot of sense, eh? And then from that point yeah. forward, I, I, it really, it just resonated with me because again, I, I, you know, I, 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 the way I, I try to make content is I always try to make sure that I'm doing a good job. Like that's always my goal. But I, I can't be worried about how other people will perceive my character based on the content that I'm making. And that was something I was trying to fight through, but I could never let, let that stupid little lingering thing mm -hmm. in the back of my head to finally dissipate and kind of be at rest. Mm -hmm. And it, mm -hmm. I think I finally put that fucking thing to bed. Thank God. And is that just the process of 
trying to let go and starting the live stream so you can't have yeah. the opportunity? Like, has it just been a process of gradually kind of letting it go? Yeah, it has been. It has been a process and and it really embracing being uncomfortable in those live streams has helped me finally put it put it to bed because then what I see is, wow, okay, so I have a ton of my time back. People still fucking enjoy it, you know? And if anything, mm -hmm. they probably enjoy it more. I get to yeah. actually uh, hang out with my community and the people that come to watch me all the time. Uh, and it's something that I just enjoy more because I'm not, uh, I don't have the, that additional weight uh, of doing something I don't like, which is the reason mm -hmm. why I started going my own path in the first place, which mm -hmm. is to focus on something that I will like as much yeah. as 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 often as I can. As if if I'm doing something mm -hmm. I don't enjoy, why the fuck did I leave Tesla in the first place? Exactly. What a yeah. stupid ass decision. <laughs> I know. I, I I understand that. I've seen. I won't name names, but I have seen some fairly sort of prolific large scale YouTubers who on podcasts and in interviews have talked about how the fact that they hate doing this kind of content, but they've got to do one every quarter. And I'm like, and these people are earning a considerable income. And I'm just thinking to myself, what the fuck are you doing with your life, bro? Why are you doing something that you don't want to do when you don't need to be doing it and putting yourself through this pain for what? But obviously people are wired differently. I can understand if something mission is super critical and super important to you that you're willing to endure pain. I mean, Believe me, I did that for 10, 15 years in my professional career, working insane, barely sleeping like an absolute moron. But that was only to achieve financial freedom and be independently in a situation financially where I don't have to answer to anyone. And now that yeah. I'm in that situation, I can't imagine spending or doing anything that I don't want to be doing and having to answer to people or creating content that I hate. Like, I just can't fathom yet. There's a lot of people who even today, despite the fact that they've built very successful you know, content creation platforms, are still doing stuff on a day-to-day -day basis that they hate. Not just dislike a little bit, hate. And yeah. I just, I can't imagine it. I really, like, I don't know how you do that. I think, I think because it, it's the trap, right? Especially if you're doing something like say, like the example that you use of the content creator that was looking at, uh, or, or yeah, the content creator that would have to do something quarterly because, you know, that's, or whatever it was uh, that they have to do it because they, they feel like they have to do it because that's what people want. Uh, mm. I'm sure they're trapped because A, it probably generates a really good income, right? And mm -hmm. then B, it's something that for some reason they they perhaps maybe are tying their self-worth to that work, which is, well, people are coming mm -hmm. to me for this, right? So maybe they're trying to be selfless about, about their mission. But I think that's mm -hmm. where... It requires, I feel like it requires two things for people to actually be able to break out of that. One is that financial freedom. Like you, if you if you are tied to that, like if that piece of thing is what's allowing you to do things that you want to do outside of that, breaking away from that is very, very scary. And then two mm -hmm. is you have to be willing to uh, accept discomfort of just get stepping outside your comfort zone and telling yourself, maybe this is not what I want, even if other people come to me for that thing. And that's a very mm -hmm. difficult one that I can, uh, relate with because I think mm. about that often too, you know, I'm like, I ask myself the question often is like, is this something what I truly want to do? Like, is it, is being on mm. YouTube or being on X making content? Is that something that I actually want to do? And does it align with, uh, does it make me happy? And for a while mm. there, for a little bit there, I was like, maybe it's not because of that mm -hmm. burnout. Cause I'm like, it, mm -hmm. how, how am I being burned out doing something I love? But then I realized I was doing it in the wrong, I was doing it in the wrong way. I wasn't yeah. embracing what, what my strengths are, which are, which I think I can be impro improvisational in a way. I think I just, mm -hmm. I wasn't embracing that. And instead I was forcing myself to be more like a newscaster type thing that had to be perfect with, and then I sound like an idiot <laughs> when I do that. So. <laughs> Uh, I love this. It's, this is like a great uh, group therapy session. I hope everyone's it is. It <laughs> feels great. No, yeah. it's, it's, it's great to hear talk, your yeah. your process though, and how you've you've shifted from being a, being a little bit unsure, and you know yeah. maybe this is the wrong thing. Why am I getting burned out? To really having nailed it, and also just dropped a lot of that baggage you're carrying around about being too self critical and worrying about what people think. I mean, did the world end after you started doing the live streams? No. Oh, the world got better, if the anything. The world didn't end. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it just goes yeah. to show, you know, if you go after what you feel like you should be doing and, and drop all that, you know, unnecessary being too hard on yourself and worrying about that. At the end of the day, most times you're going to feel better and probably end up being more successful, however you measure that anyway, happier and just feel like you're having more impact. And, and yeah, it's very rarely, I think, the right choice to keep doing something that you know doesn't feel right. Yeah. Because in the end... 
it just builds and builds and builds and drags you down. Like I had a, a finance business a few years ago and I was really enjoying what I was doing initially, but I realized fairly early on that I wasn't going to be able to positively impact as many people as my goals that I'd set. I'm like, fuck, what do I do here? Growing a great business, I'm killing it. And I'll be earning millions of dollars a year, not too long from now. So I had the golden handcuffs. It's fulfilling, but it's not going to help me meet my goals. And it, I spent sort of six months trying to figure it out, being in denial. Like I was just, oh, fuck, what do I do? And really just trying to create some space. And because I was working 80 plus hours a week, I didn't really have time to think. So it was a really yeah. tough situation, but I had to make that call. And a lot of people around me like, dude, are you, are you serious, bro? You're like, you're absolutely slaying it. What, you know, you got to, and I'm like, yeah, I'm, I have to do this. So I can understand having gone through a sort of similar process. And at the end of the day, I gave up a business that was earning a few hundred thousand dollars a year, very fulfilling, and that was on track to keep growing, but I didn't need any additional money. I thought, well, I'm not going to be worrying about how do I pay my bills for a long time. Let's close this thing down and try to figure out where do I go from here in such a way that I don't feel like I'm going to get burnt out and that I am completely in line with my goals. And I had no idea what my plan would be. This is why I flew over to Peru and did some ayahuasca ceremonies to try and figure out what next. Yeah. And so I sort of jumped into the, the unknown, but I knew that I needed to do that because what I was doing ultimately wouldn't satisfy me because I'd be wondering, you know, my goals over here, what I'm doing is not going to get me there. Like something needs to change. So yeah, you yeah. sometimes got to take that leap of faith, even if you don't know what the, what the answer is. And I, and I hope people are listening to this. Like, you know, we haven't talked about what we usually talk about, but I think this is still yeah. is, is super valuable. I feel like, I mean, it's valuable mm -hmm. for me because it's, you're somebody that I really respect. And I mean, I, I know you understand this battle and, and I just, I, 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 it just feels good being able to talk to somebody else that understands this battle who ha who I also look to as somebody is like, I want to give as little fucks as that guy. Right. So it's, it's very good <laughs> for me. I want to take advantage of the situation, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Yep. So, but, but I do think it's going to help. I, I do think it's going to help others that are maybe struggling with this, but let me, let me jump on a, let me jump on a, on a train of thought there that you just brought up. It's like, so you didn't, uh, you didn't, you were working 80 hours a week. You didn't have enough time to think about what you really wanted to like, how, what the next steps are for you to be truly happy with where you're going with your life and your goals mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. you were able to kind of get there. But so since we cover sort of AI, uh, sort of in, in an adjacent manner with, with the Tesla story, one of my theories is that there is a chance for AI robotics, you know, the age of abundance to allow many to go through this enlightenment where people mm -hmm. will have the time to discover mm -hmm. this, like, yeah. which in a way it's like AI will allow the individual to align their fullest potential uh, with with what they're doing, right? Instead of like, oh, I have to work this yeah. job to pay the bills, yeah. right? It's inevitable what? that this will happen over have you thought, yeah. a long enough period okay. of time. Inevitable. And it's going to be a crisis of meaning and purpose for a lot of people, big time. Like this is a serious issue that humanity is going to face in the next decade or two. And I, I don't think people are ready for it because I can speak for me as a man and I think on behalf of most men, if we don't have a very clear and defined purpose or a mission, it's a downward spiral. Very quick. It's true. Very quick. Now, hashtag misogynist, please cancel me, bro. But most women, <laughs> generally speaking, have a built-in mission to raise a wonderful family. That's just yeah. the facts. Now, that's not to say that women can't have careers. You do whatever you want. But yeah. most women will find themselves, if at the end of their life, if they've had a wonderful family and some children, tick, I had a great life, successful life, I'm fulfilled. I completed my purpose, my mission. Men are not wired the same way. We we need a, a dragon to slay or something that, and so I think everyone's going to have this issue, but men in particular, and you see what happens when men lose a job or, or lose a purpose, drugs, alcohol, addiction, gambling. It's just a very downward spiral for a lot of guys. And I think this is something that people aren't aware is around the corner, but AI is going to cause massive disruption. And when it gets to a point where AI is physically and intellectually as capable as the average person, and then more so, most people aren't going to be able to meaningfully contribute or add any value to the marketplace. And so then what do you do with your time? And if people aren't able to nurture their existing passions and interests and those kind of things, where to from here? I think there's going to be some big struggles for a lot of guys that in particular, women as well, but I really do think it's going to affect men a lot more. And it's going to be very positive for the people that can, you know, follow their passions and interests and hobbies. But yeah, I think there's going to be a pretty dark side to that as well.